how to develop a Zelda like with 3JS. You're on the Nightcoder channel, and in this series of videos, I'm going to show you how to develop a game with a physics engine and a 3D engine, all in pure JavaScript. Let's go! I'm sorry, I haven't made a video in several months. I have been very busy developing my visual novel editor. I've finished the first version. It's up and running and sales have started. I was finally able to take a break and develop the Zelda like I'd promised on Discord. In this tutorial, we'll look at how to use 3JS for the graphics engine, Rapier for the physics engine, and Blender for level and game design. As for the code, as always, I've kept it as simple as possible. No TypeScript, no external libs, no complex packages. This is minimalist code. We're focused solely on the subject. All external elements are removed. So that's it. I've laid the foundations. Let's get started. First, I'll install the dependencies and use Vite as my development server. I install 3JS for the graphics engine and Rapier for the physics engine. All libs are installed. I prepare the startup script. Everything's ready. I start the project. Everything's okay. For the entry point, we'll use app.js. All we need is a canvas to run WebGL. I create the app.js file. All set. Now we can start coding a Zelda-like with 3JS. First step, I'm going to instantiate the scene. The scene will contain all the objects we want to display. Now we need a camera to observe the scene. For the camera, I'll use a perspective camera. I'll take a 70 degree angle and give it the screen ratio. I position the camera on the Z axis and use the look at method to orient the camera at the center of the scene. Now I'll instantiate the WebGL rendering engine. The constructor needs the canvas where we're going to generate the image. To render, I call the render method. As parameters, I specify the scene I want to display and the camera I want to use. We have a black screen because the stage is totally empty. I'm going to add a geometry. I'll put in a box and instantiate a mesh that will use the array of vertices in this geometry. Very importantly, we add this instance to the scene. The cube is displayed. Now I'll instantiate a shader and use it to display the mesh. We've got a black screen, so all's well, that's normal. This shader simulates the behavior of light. And so the surfaces need a light source to be illuminated. I instantiate a light. I'll position it at camera level to make it easier. And very importantly, the light must be added to the scene to be taken into account by the shaders. It works, we're up and running, we've got classic 3JS code, and here we come to an important point in the project. I've chosen object-oriented programming. It seems to me to be the best pattern for video game development. I'm not going to go into the theory here, so if you're not familiar with it, I suggest you go online to understand the concept. In this video, I'm going to focus on practice. The game is going to need cameras, lights, meshes with custom properties and behaviors. I'm not going to code the whole game on the app.js file. Each instance will have its own variables and behaviors. I'll start with the camera. I'll create a camera that inherits from the 3JS camera. I take the perspective camera class and create a camera class that inherits from the perspective camera class. For the moment, I'm simply modifying the camera constructor. So it's going to be exactly the same functions as perspective camera. I'm simply modifying the camera's default properties. I import my custom class. I can delete the native 3JS camera and replace it with my new camera. The code is already easier to read and simpler. Now let's do the same thing with light. 
This time I'll start with Object 3D. This is the root class of all 3JS components. I'm going to simulate more realistic lighting using two components, ambient light and point light. 3D object properties and methods are common to virtually all 3JS components. If you're using a camera, mesh or light, you can use the position and rotation properties and add a child object. In the same way, from the light class, we have specific lights. We have point light, direction light, and ambient light. It's the same for the camera, for the mesh. I invite you to have a look at the dock. The important thing to remember is that Object 3D is an entity located in space that can itself contain other entities. I'm creating a new file for light. I'll use ambient light, point light, and will inherit from Object 3D. I create a custom constructor. Don't forget to call the super function to call the parent constructor. I instantiate a default ambient light and I instantiate a point light. And I add these two components to the space of our future instance. If I move an instance based on light, both components will move at the same time. Moreover, I can directly choose the position of the light point inside this component. I add the export declaration to transform this file into a module. Now all that's left to do is import the new component and replace the old light. Our game has a fully customizable camera and light instance. And now I'm going to do the same thing with the graphics engine. So I'm going to use WebGL renderer and create a class that will take care of the rendering loop and the post-processing of the game. And once again, the aim here is to simplify the main game code as much as possible. This class will contain several properties, including our game scene, a clock to measure time, the game's camera, a customizable function that will be called at each frame and the main loop. I create the constructor. The renderer instance will need the scene and camera. The WebGL renderer needs the canvas to function. I initialize the properties. I store the loop method in a variable and force the context of our instance. In passing, I inform the renderer to take shading into account when rendering. Now, I'll write the game's main loop. I use clock to retrieve the delta t between each frame. If the game has an update function, I'll call it. Finally, I trigger the rendering. Finally, I trigger the rendering. I use the request animation frame API to call the rendering loop as soon as the browser has finished rendering. This is why I store the loop function in a variable with the instance context. All that remains is to add the setter to pass the game update function. To avoid adding even more code, we'll start the rendering loop as soon as the renderer is instantiated everything will become clearer. I instantiate the renderer with the camera and the game scene. And this is where we'll have our function that updates our game every frame. In this way, all components that require updating every frame will be called up in this function. Now we come to the very important part of level design and art direction. For this project, the main tool will be Blender. I've modeled and textured graphic assets to compose a level, but that's the subject of another video. For development, I've simply modeled a chunk that will help us develop the engine's mechanics. I start by creating a file that will help us load the 3D resources. I'm using GLTF Loader, so it's important to remember to export these Blender files in a compatible format. I recommend loading with Load Async as it's promised to be easier to read. We'll get a GLB file, and from there, I'll divide the meshes into two arrays. The meshes I'm going to use as visual elements, and the meshes I'm going to use as colliders. To sum up, we have a Blender file with meshes, and I'm going to distribute the meshes according to their name. For this project, I've chosen the following conventions. Meshes with the keyword visual are visual elements. Meshes with the keyword collider are collision elements, and so on with mobs, 
and other game elements, I go through all the root elements in the 3D file and divide them up by name. At this stage of the tutorial, I'm only recovering the visual elements. This time, we're not exporting a class, but a function. We return to the project root and retrieve the loading function. All the resources making up the level will be grouped by category in the meshes variable. Above all, don't forget to add the resources to the server in the public directory. By default, Vite serves this directory. All the visual elements that have been loaded will be added to the scene. I adjust the camera because we can't see anything. That's it, it works. You can see the game environment. But I'm not going to leave the code like that, it wouldn't be maintainable. I'm going to create a specific instance that will manage the level's display and behavior. I'll create a new class called World, which will inherit from Object 3D. As far as the constructor is concerned, I'm going to do the same thing for all the entities in the game, whether it's the level, the player, or the mobs. I initialize the physics of the instance and I initialize the visual part of the instance. For the moment, we don't have any physics. As for the visual part, I'll simply retrieve the meshes and add them to the instance. And in passing, I'll enable light interception and shadow reception. You can't preset this behavior with the GLTF format, so it requires more code. That's a shame. I encourage you to preset as much visual information as possible on the 3D editor side. Textures, materials, animations, placements. The less code you have, the more maintainable your project will be. We return to the project root and I instantiate the level. All visual elements are passed to the constructor during instantiation. Here, the code is really self-explanatory. I'll just take a quick look at shadows. How shadows work with 3JS. To display shadows, we need meshes that intercept light with the cast shadow property. And we need meshes that take light interception into account with the receive shadow property, provided that the material and shader used are compatible. And finally, we need a light source that takes shadow generation into account with the cast shadow property. I'll do it right away. I'll activate the cast shadow property of the light. That's it. Shadow properties can be set according to the type of light. The bias property is the interception distance between a surface and the light source. As soon as this distance is reached, a shadow is generated. Since my objects generate shadows on themselves, I set a negative bias to prevent surfaces from self-darkening. You can choose the resolution of the shadow texture. And it works. So why do I absolutely want to use shadows? For a game that's going to be in semi-isometric view, it's going to help our brains locate our character in relation to the ground. It's going to make the game easier to read. I'm going to finish this first part by adding the game's character. I'll go into the loader and grab the other graphics elements from the 3D file. I'll add a new array for the character assets. This is just to keep things consistent. There's only one character, but the code looks better that way. Collider's in the collider array and the character in the character array. And I return my three categories of meshes. We're going to use a new class, the player class. I instantiate it, pass it its visual representation and add it to the scene. As for the class, I will do the same as for the world class. The player class inherits from the object 3D class. I could also inherit directly from the mesh class, but afterwards there will be animations and a skeleton, so it's simpler to have an abstract class. We initialize the physics and we initialize the graphics. I initialize the position property by copying the position of the character chosen in Blender. Note that the 3D object is positioned in the game world, while the mesh is located at the center of the 3D object. It's not the mesh that will move, it's the character instance that will move. I record all this and our character appears on the screen. For the moment, there's no physics engine, so the character doesn't fall to the ground. We'll deal with that in the next video. At this stage, we can display levels designed with Blender. In the next video, 
we'll see how to use the Rapier physics engine to add physics to our game. And we'll use the gamepad to interact with the character. For those who want to test the game right away, it's available on the itch.io platform. It saves me having to deploy my own platform, which saves time. However, I'd advise you to have a controller, because the game was designed to be played with one. So don't forget to subscribe, so you don't miss the rest of the tutorial. And don't forget to like, as usual. That was Coder de Nuit, and I'll see you next time. Salut! Yeah!